So let's get started. Anya, uh, we're very, very pleasure to, to have you today as our special guest speaker uh, uh, at this event. And uh, I would like to learn a little bit more about yourself. Can you tell us, share with us a little bit more about your background? Sure. Well, first of all, Mark, thank you so much for having me. I think doing um, this kind of interviews is great for a lot of people so that it can actually learn from others and interact especially. So I like the part of interaction that you always include. Um, so my name is Anya. Um, I often use the name Anya from Alemania. For those of you who don't speak Spanish, Alemania means in Spanish Germany. And with that, uh, you also know where I am from originally. So I was born and raised in Germany. I left Germany many, many years ago, about 13 years ago, um, because I've always kind of wanted to live in other countries, learn other languages, especially. Um, I am a polyglot entre entrepreneur, and that means the polyglot is a person. Sometimes people think when they hear polyglots, they think about the programmation languages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm talking about the, the real languages and in real world, let's say. Um, so I've learned many languages myself and I actually use them a lot in my business um, and languages just open uh, many doors. I'm the founder of uh, Zaloa Languages. I've also started some other companies, but Zaloa Languages is definitely my main business. Okay, okay, that, that's great. And as we mentioned, we very much appreciate having you today. And so you're able to, to share with, you, with us all the knowledge that, that you have and all your experience. Uh, the main topic for this conversation is having a cultural impact, uh, which is very, very important nowadays. Uh, I believe that sometimes we, as founders, we miss that uh, entirely, right? Like uh, we, we believe like, hey, we're here for doing business and that's it. And uh, that's uh, that's completely wrong. I, I mean, like we should build and we should aim for generating an impact and building something that is significant to others. So I would like to start with the first question uh, on that topic. I, I mean, how did you define having a cultural impact? Okay, so I think in terms of when you do something in languages, many people might think, oh, this is quite obvious. So you have an impact in a culture like a culture of a country a culture of a language but it's not just that a cultural impact depending on what you define culture is also for example we have a company culture we have a family culture uh, we even have a friend circle culture right so what i mean with that when i talk about cultural impact is impact somehow in an environment um, that we interact with um, and that can also be um, within the company, but it can also be in a just a specific town, for example, or a specific area just for developers, um, for example, right? So the, the culture of developers. Um, so this is for me what I mean with the cultural impact to somehow have an impact in a group of people. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I mean with that. And an impact, um, yeah, somehow a change of perspective, a change in action, um, a, a trigger of, of doing things differently. Um, that's what I mean with cultural impact. Okay, that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. And okay, in your case, how do you measure that impact? I, I mean, like, I understand that you will involve several different people to be in your group and then uh, having them uh, interact with you, with your proposal. But I mean, how do you measure if, they, if that was like a, a good impact or not? I think measuring, so as entrepreneurs, right, we always focus on numbers and I do that a lot. I think numbers are a great way of um, telling myself whether uh, something was successful or not. Um, but, um, Sometimes it's just, you can't always put it in numbers. So it's also sometimes a way of interpretation. Um, but as an example, so my cultural impact in, in case of Zalawa languages, so we help people to uh, learn languages. We build language learning communities. We connect those language learning communities with companies in other countries um, so that actually learning the language offers also a better job opportunity. 
And as an additional product or as an additional service, actually, what we do is we focus on Nahuatl. Nahuatl is an mm. indigenous uh, language from Mexico, for those of you who, who don't know it. Um, it's still spoken by about 2 million people. There is very few material to learn Nahuatl. Um, there is very few speakers who, pe who speak the language publicly. Um, so what we decided to do years ago is to, because we know we have the skills of, of showing others how to learn a language. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we started to do a couple of years ago is to work with native speakers of that language, of Nahuatl in that case, and to build material out of that, to build a video course also out of that. And so we offer that video course and no money at all, like it's 100% based on donations so that everyone has access to that language. Um, and so this is something that, for example, we can measure, right? So we can say, when we started that a couple of years ago, we had zero people learning <laughs> now what with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. right so then me and my business partner we started learning now so we were two right? okay okay <laughs> it's progress right <laughs> yeah and we started like the first group we started for the first time talking about that on social media so then we we had eventually a group of 10 people yay <laughs> then nice. we started talking about it kept doing videos about it kept doing our youtube channel um and then um after maybe a couple of weeks we had 50 and then 100 people so that was something that we could definitely measure because we, could, we, we were able to say how many people mm -hmm. did impact in a way of that they would start doing what we want them to do or what we want society to do which is um, learning indigenous languages or at least acknowledging uh, indigenous languages. Right? Well that, that's pretty impressive and one thing that, that I ask myself in this situation is um, what was the main motivators for these people to learn uh, this new language? Because sometimes you, you learn a language to, in order to get uh, better opportunities for finding a job. In this case, uh, in Mexico, people learn English or learn German, German in order to, to be able to, to, to work on those places, right? But why people will pursue an indigenous language in, in this case? Okay, so... Um... There's different reasons. So I guess people who somehow have a relationship with Mexico, so Mexicans who live in Mexico or Mexicans who live outside of Mexico and who have maybe learned other languages before, um, they learn the language to connect with their roots, right? Um, I'm also the co-organizer of the big polyglot conference. So we have a huge crowd of polyglots of people learning multiple languages. So for them, it's also a challenge. So some people might also do it as a new challenge, right? Um, but I guess the way that we impacted most people with that is definitely because we inspired others to do the same. So my Nahuatl teacher um, quoted this once. It, it's his quote. I wish it was mine, but it's not. He said, when you are in Mexico as a foreigner or as a Mexican, it doesn't really matter, and you speak Spanish, it's like seeing the country in black and white. But once you start learning an indigenous language, it's like you start seeing the colors of the country, wow. which is true because everything, like so many things from food to um, names of a town or, or streets or whatever, um, have origins in Nahuatl, right? So then you, you start actually seeing this. And so once we started talking about that online as well, like we would say, okay, so um, Mazatlan, right? They, everyone, or a lot of people in Mexico know Mazatlan for its beach town. And, and But then a lot of people are like, okay, I know it's something with Nahuatl. Okay, yeah. But what does it actually mean? Me. Mazatlan, uh -huh. right? um, yeah, so I guess it's a lot through inspiration and as entrepreneurs, that's what we always want to do, right? We want to create an impact through, or a change actually, through um, inspiration. And again, in our, in our case, this culture uh, is maybe very much focused on a Mexican culture, um, but this is exactly the same for company culture within the company, uh, a client culture, right? A community culture. So basically you can apply this to, every kind Multiple. of culture be part of yeah wow that, that's pretty impressive and you also maybe changed my mind on that perspective because it is like okay you have to know the roots of your own country right like and not only in mexico like you mentioned in colombia in brazil or even in europe or in the united states 
will have roots and we are able to connect with them that will be very very awesome and how do you turn this cultural impact into business i mean like there's always you have to be able to create a lot of value in order to get uh your business growing right so you can also grow your cultural impact at the same time so what what is that process like yeah it's a it's a very hard question and to be honest we're often struggling with that because we would like to do way more for indigenous languages sometimes people write us and and they ask me oh but can't you do the same for my language i'm from peru and and here we speak um a quechua or you know like they, they tell me about different languages and i'm like yeah i would love to but the day got only 24 hours right <laughs> so it's hard because we also have a company um we have uh, employees we have we have to pay salaries we have to pay um yeah our platforms that we use right our providers yeah um, so i guess it's 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 sometimes hard to find this balance um but we do that my business partner and i we do that at least every semester, sometimes even every quarter, we write down our big vision, what we have as a vision, right? So our big vision in that case is to break language barriers. And then we break it down into different parts. So this can be within the team. We have a team from many different um, uh, countries with many different backgrounds. So that's even hard sometimes to work in another language. Then we have this breaking language barriers for our clients, but then also for society, for people who are not our clients, right? Um, so it's hard to find the balance and what we make sure, first of all, because as entrepreneurs, we have to pay ourselves a salary. We have to pay, well, everything that goes with having a company, right? Yeah. Um, so we have to make sure, first of all, that this income is stable that we for example we offer right now three languages german spanish and nahuatl nahuatl doesn't bring us any money like we can't even pay our costs with that right we okay. do get some donations but it's still it's like far away from being profitable and we still put money into it then spanish is let's say okay but german is the language that really helps us to increase our income. Mm -hmm. And so only through German, we can actually help Nahuatl in the end. So it's very important to focus also on the ones that bring the income. And then even within that department, you can also create a cultural impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like leveraging this also between your different um, business uh, departments, let's say, um, is also worth it. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting because it, it, it not only applies to a company that is, helping you to learn different. Uh, uh, so in this case applies to any other company, right? Like if you have a core business uh, that is helping you to grow and then you can focus your resources on other aspects of, of your business that are also growing uh, at a different pace, right? Because that, that happens all the time. That's, that's very, very interesting. And that brings me to my next question. In this case, how does the cultural impact evolves over time? Uh, is it normal for a company to change its core focus uh, in order to adapt or should it keep it straight on, on that matter? Um, yeah, I think absolutely. Like in this uh, fast changing environment, it's it's quite normal to, to change, right? Like um, uh, you might have, for, even from your business model, you might have a complete pivot from time to time every couple of years or whenever it is necessary. So I think as for every business decision you take, it, it's the same about cultural impact. I do believe that you should, as a business owner, always think about what your business or what your company provides as an extra value, right? Are you solving a problem? Or do you help people with your business? So what is actually, because as entrepreneurs, we, we actually have the power and we took the decision to do something that is maybe like not the norm for many others right so we have the power and, and the impact of, of of doing it so use it wisely and that might change over time example like we had a big um change when when i started zaloa um i uh, start I, i'm the well when i start when I founded the Zaloa, I was the only founder back in 2015. Um, I started the company in Germany. 
Um, but back then I would already live in Mexico. So then two years later, I took that decision to like move the company, the headquarters from Germany to Mexico to start the company with my Mexican business partner. And when I started the company, my initial idea was always because learning language, like, unfortunately, it's not, not everyone can pay for that, right? Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I know there is like definitely free resources out there to learn language, but if you really want a, um, a program to learn language that really brings you value and, and that is actually going to bring you some success, then at some point you, you, you will need to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, not everyone can afford that. And I just think that this is not fair. So when I started Zaloa, I wanted... Those people who can afford it, I always wanted to, to take a portion of that company or of that uh, revenue in the end um, to pay for those um, scholarships for people who cannot who can afford, afford it. All, right? Sounds easier than it is because you have to make this, you know, limit who can pay for it, who cannot pay for it. And then people might tell you, yeah, I can pay for it, but only because... Um, I, I don't know, stopped doing anything else in my life. And I saved my money for three months to pay that course. Right. So it's, it's actually really hard, but that was the initial idea of like taking money from the revenue to help people who cannot afford learning a language. So that was the initial idea. Then two years later, when I moved the headquarters from Germany to Mexico, um, I started working with someone in Mexico who told me about his business and he um, is, uh, his whole town, they make tortillas, right? Okay. And, like delicious blue corn tortillas. Nice. <laughs> exactly. Like really, like, you know, this handmade and, and, and like actually really from the town and just delicious. And so uh, he told me, yeah, so now we're actually, we uh, we have um, sales points in Guadalajara, in Mexico City, in Puebla, in Monterrey. Um, and one day I'd love to sell my products in the United States. And I was like, well, what's holding you back? And he was like, well, I don't speak English. I was like, well, I give you the scholarship. So we started that and we gave him the scholarship. And then in the end, he invited us to his town. And so this the entire family, even the entire town, they were so grateful for that opportunity. So then we had like lunch together. And in the end, we decided that we wanted to help the entire town. So we would send every, uh, well, couple of days, um, native English teachers, or sometimes not yeah. even native, but um, English teachers to that town and um, teach them English for free and a group for kids and a group for adults, right? So it sounds great. We would help people to learn English. Wow, awesome. <laughs> but after a couple of years, we realized this um, thing that, well, the, the barriers that exist with indigenous languages. And I was like, oh my gosh, we are helping people learning English. Well, there is really indigenous languages who could actually really use our help, right? So then we also did this pivot and we changed that and um, started focusing on indigenous languages. So I think it is definitely possible, but when you plan your year or even your semester or your quarter, you should always have a mission included somehow um, that helps others. Even and if it's within the company culture, if you say, okay, I want to help young people to integrate in my company and I take, I don't know, two hours per week to help those young people so that they can do an internship with us or something like that or something. That, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And how do you escalate your business uh, these days uh, without losing its core mission? Because that's something that happens, right? Like you mentioned, if you want to adapt and you rediscover new possibilities and other, and other things to teach to people, how do you escalate your business without losing track? Yeah, um, it is hard sometimes, to be honest. It's not always easy. Um, and again, we have this so on the one hand, we, we have to focus on um, having a scalable business model. And then on the other hand, we also want to do some good for society. Um, I think the way you have to see it when you try to scale your business, when you really focus on having a higher income, is to change your mindset about money, right? Um, so often people think that in society, at least, not, not necessarily entrepreneurs, but a lot of people think that money is a bad thing, which is just not. 
because it depends. It's like giving someone a microphone, right? So you do hear your interviews and some people out there might do podcasts or whatever. And you can use a microphone to deliver a message that encourages others to do beautiful things. Or you can use a microphone and start, I don't know, doing really bad things. I mean, we've seen that in history. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the same with money. You can use money and you can scale your business to do great things, or you can scale your business because you're selfish and because you want to do bad things with money and you want to keep it all for yourself. But honestly, most entrepreneurs, at least the ones that I met, they don't do it primarily for the money because it's a lot of work being an entrepreneur. It's a lot of sleepless nights. It's a lot yeah. of, yeah, right? So we all know that. So most people really don't do that for the money. And those are, in my opinion, also the ones that are going to have success. So then focusing on scaling the business is actually a good thing when you consider that with that money that you get through scaling your business, you can then in the end do all other beautiful things with it, right? That's that's pretty nice. Yeah, because money is more like a tool at the end of it, right? In order to achieve those that, that cultural impact or that impact that you're looking for at the end. So why you start that company? Okay, that, that's great. And um, in, in this case, when, you, when you're spreading the word about your company and reaching out to multiple audience and they perceive you as, as a cultural impact company that is focused on providing these tools to people uh do you think that also affects the business side of, of your company because they perceive like oh i was hoping this was for free and i uh, don't oh know all that stuff so how do you manage to to keep people on track on what uh, generates you business as well yeah um both sides so you have um client side and investor side right um on the client side you see people um who say like oh but uh, this should be for free um i want to learn this for free right and you're like yeah i wish i could do that but i can't um but we find somehow also ways of so for example right now our business model focuses on we have a b2c part but we also have a big b2b part and the b2b ones the companies that we work with they're looking for hispanos for latinos learning german and they're the ones paying for the Uh, Latinos learning German because they want to hire them in Germany because there is a huge um, lack of workforce in, in Germany in terms of hospitals like doctors, nurses, but also engineers, so different areas. So this is then when we say our, when we tell our customers, yeah, we, we wish we could offer it for free, but we can't. Um, but here's this opportunity, you might want to apply for that program, right? On the other hand, it can also be a disadvantage because an investor Why does an investor invest? Because it's usually for the money, right? Yeah. Um, and we do have some people who say like, oh yeah, this is very nice what you guys are doing, but are you actually making any money with that? And then you just show them the, the numbers. And if you make money with it, then they're also going to be like, oh, okay, that's nice. So you're making money plus you're making an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's sometimes hard again to like uh, balance this a little bit um, because yeah you can easily listen to a lot of people who just really focus on the revenue 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 yeah but as an entrepreneur you also want to have fun and it's fine to listen to advice and i do that every day but in the end it's also your company it's your values in the company and um, that's what you should always follow and as long as you can convince the right investors to invest into your company Um, because they believe not only in you as a person or in your product, but also in your mission and the vision that you have for society, then you know that this is the right investor. And if you have someone who is only focused on, on the money side, yeah, for us, that wouldn't be the right investor, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe that they, they always talk about smart money and how that people will invest, but also generate more value to you. And if someone that shared their vision and it's all connected to, To the to the impact that you want to generate, that's that's the best way to to go with it. And so that's that's great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, from the from the audience. So okay, I, I'm gonna read it out loud. The first one: How do you think that culture might be improved, affected by being more and more remote without work and interactions? 
how could we make culture uh, be the big winner instead of something that is getting lost? Yeah, um, a very smart question. Um, so again, I, because this focuses on the remote uh, part, uh, working remotely, um, I think uh, as for the employees and same for the employer, for the company, for the startup, um, it's very important to keep a company culture and you can do that. And there is tons of startups right now working on how to keep a company culture alive when working remotely. So this is one thing, right, to interact with each other and to always remind each other also of the real vision that the company has um, but then also, and I think this is something that um, in many, many countries is not discussed um, enough, is mental health. Um, I think mental health here is also very important. In, at Zaloa, for example, we offer all our employees a monthly budget for therapists. Okay. Um, and I think this is extremely important as well, because when we talk about this cultural thing to belong and, and to create something beautiful, we first have to be healthy, right? In order yeah. to, and this is not just our body, this is especially also our mind. Um, so I guess in order to answer that question, um, there is many ways, technology um, to focus on a culture when working remotely. Um, it, there is many ways to do that through technology, um, but there's also many exercises that you can even do without technology. Yeah, I, I, I agree on that. And it is something that is going to happen either way, right? Like uh, this, this culture inside the company is something that is evolving constantly. And if you're able to, to accommodate that uh, to, to the changes in your company, then you have to be aware what is important and yeah. why your, your, your colleagues, uh, your co-workers should be focused in also, right? Like they have to be working on, on that. And I think even this is going to change. And I am so excited for that. It's, it's going to change even more in the future with VR. Like there are so many, I'm, I'm right now in Austin and I see so many companies working on virtual reality yeah. for other companies. I mean, we talk about metaverse, we talk about so many virtual reality cases for language learning. This is going to be extremely important in my opinion. Um, and so there is also, you know, like a digital physical space somewhere in between where you can also work on, on culture. So um, technology, again, same as for money, is not our enemy here. It's our friend, depending on how we use it. Yeah, it's a tool at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from the audience. What would you say is the easiest way to become a polyglot? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that <laughs> word. Um, yeah, that's a very hard question. So um, I guess same as for business, uh, get started. Get started with the first language. Um, a lot of people feel stuck with one language and then they think they're not good at languages, which like honestly doesn't really exist. Um, just get started, get out there, start with one language, um, get to a decent level. You can then start a next one and, and you'll see like it's it's like everything in life, right? The more you do, it's like same for fitness. The more you train, the better you'll get. Um, and when you start or playing an instrument, music, for example, yeah, you start learning how to play the piano. And then maybe learning the guitar is not as difficult anymore because you've learned another instrument, even though it's completely different. But, you know, like you get the feeling for it. And that's the same for languages. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to get started and... Um, uh, really also dedicate an amount of time. There is like, I always tell our, our language learners, unfortunately, there is no magic pill that I could give you and tomorrow you wake up speaking three languages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <It's> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no, that, that's great. And, yeah. and uh, could you share with us what are the next steps for your company? I, I mean, like, how do you imagine your company evolving over time and the next couple of years? Absolutely. <laughs> I have to, I always have to think when I get this question, like, what am I allowed to say now? And, <laughs> yeah. and what is still a secret, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I guess over the past years, we've been, we've been focusing a lot on our B2C part. So on um, uh, B2C, uh, on customers who want to learn uh, languages for different reasons. Um, Post-COVID, 
um, it's, in my opinion, for any kind of business, extremely important to um, focus on community building, on having a real relationship with your customers, right? So this is one part of the future of Zaloa. So um, we're going to focus even more on the community building. We're going to integrate amazing technology next year, which I, I think can't tell yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, but we're going to use, I, I think I can say that we're going to use technology next year in order to focus even more on the community building on the reason why people learn language. So let's say people um, who learn German, some of them might learn German um, because they want to study a semester abroad. Some of them might want to learn German because their moms, Latina moms living in Germany. Others want to do an au pair year. Others want to work as an engineer. So we want to gather those different groups and we want them to help each other, to support each other, to go through the language learning part together, right? So this is one part of, of 2022, which is our big B2C focus, um, the community creation and uh, strengthen the community. Um, and then we have a big um, B2B part, um, which we're gonna focus on next year. Um, so again, we have in, in Germany, as in many other countries, a huge problem of a um, huge lack of skilled uh, workforce. Um, so Germany is looking every year for 400,000 people. Whoa. Whoa. I know. I know. <laughs> crazy, right? Crazy. Yeah. Um, we have seen that in many other countries before, even in Germany in the 70s, 80s. Um, when they invited a lot of people from Turkey uh, to come to Germany. Um, and so this time, uh, the German government plus the companies, I hope, have learned from that, from their mistakes in the past. And it seems so because they're investing a lot of money into um, getting those people to Germany, but then also integrating them. And a big key for integration is definitely language. So we want to focus more on this B2B part. Um, to be part of that movement of helping German companies to find people from Latin America and then to help those people from Latin America to learn German for the companies in Germany. Nice. And are you thinking also besides uh, going to other countries? I mean, like, for example, England or uh, any other countries in Europe or in Asia that also mm -hmm. can uh, connect with Latin America? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it would definitely be necessary, right, especially for the US and uh, Canada. I mean, this is also what you do at Symbiosis, right? Yeah. You also connect the two worlds. Um, so it would definitely be necessary, um, especially for the US and, and Canada. It's um, uh, time zone wise, etc. It's, it's easier to, to work together. Um, unfortunately, the day has only 24 hours, right? Yeah. Uh, we've learned from our mistakes in the past. We used to offer at Zalo 13 languages, 13, and um, we just can't do everything at the same time. So our current focus is really to focus on the German language. And we do have in our long-term plan also uh, some other countries, some other languages. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, First, we need to focus a little more. So, yeah, it's, it's a process, right? Like every startup needs to focus on a specific niche and then grow from it. So, well, uh, Anya, we very much appreciate your time today. I believe it was a very, very valuable insights that you shared with us regarding the cultural impact and also building a business at the same time. Uh, for all the attendees that uh, shared your questions, we appreciate that. We're going to uh, send this recording uh, to use it, you can view it as much uh, as you want. And also we will uh, share Anya's contact uh, on, on, on email so you can reach out to her. Uh, do you have any any website you would like to share with us so, so they can visit? Sure, I think usually the easiest way to connect with me is on, on LinkedIn. So if you wanna uh, link maybe my LinkedIn profile, really feel free to uh, reach out. Um, I just want to say, I just wanted to say like to everyone watching this now or later, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an employee, no matter what, um, I think we're all here in this world to somehow have an impact and uh, everyone matters um, in, in that mission. Um, and I, I wish you best of, of luck with everything you're planning to do in, in the future. Um, and uh, I know that there is sometimes ups and downs in life. 
um, on a personal level, on a professional level, everything. Um, but uh, I really believe in, in everyone out there doing great things for the world. So good luck with everything. I love those words. And yeah, I, I, I share with them. Uh, I share with you those uh, that, that way of thinking. I, I believe that it's important that we continue to pursue our goals all the time as entrepreneurs. And yeah, we very much appreciate your time today. And we, will, we, we hope to have you again uh, soon in, in these events. Thank you very much, Omar. <laughs> My pleasure. You have a good one. Take care.